for our next speaker. Um, we are especially grateful because he stepped in last minute. He has slept probably like seven hours in the past 48. I don't know, something crazy. He does things and stuff. He asked me to particularly say that. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, a man who does things and stuff, Matt Dillahunty. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna be rude and interject um, very quickly. We have a Nerf booth. Rob runs a Nerf group. It's really cool. They have a booth where you can shoot at each other and please go and shoot Nerf guns. Okay, sorry. Things and stuff. I'm gonna do some things and stuff. How you guys doing? Woo! Woo! I am, uh, I'd say I'm extremely excited to be here, but I plan. I can't turn off any microphone except the one that's attached to me. Uh, can we leave the lights up for just a, a little bit? We can turn them back off after I get done with a, a volunteer thing. Um, but I, I am excited to be here. We plan to be here anyway because uh, of the prom. My wife and I have never been to a prom together, so we're going to the prom. And, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, Lauren contacted me and said, hey, can you fill in? And I said, hell yeah, because I've never turned down an opportunity to talk. <laughs> I don't shut up. Um, I was here at Skepticon 5, and I started off my, my talk then by presenting a magic trick. I did it via video, uh, because I do a lot of close-up magic. Um, and you guys can't see cards from back there. And so this year, uh, I, I want to try and keep this as a tradition. On the off chance that I get invited back, then maybe I'll just do like some kind of magic trick every year. So I wanted to start off before I get to the meat of the talk, and I won't keep you here all night. I appreciate we're, right, we're late, and uh, I'm grateful for people to hang out. Uh, but I need a volunteer who doesn't know me particularly well, and you. What's your name? Kara. Yes. Kara? Sarah. Sarah. Can you come up on stage? Do you mind? Let's give her a round of applause. Thanks. <laughs> now, we've never met before? Cool. Which is, you know, there's only a, bunch, a handful of people here that that's the case. But I need you to come over here to this microphone and we'll make sure that we've got it uh, adjusted properly. And you're gonna face this direction because you don't like those people. Okay, All right. fair enough. I, I have here um, a way to make my microphone make noises. This is the adventure of Sherlock Holmes. Go ahead and uh, flip through it real quick. What I'm gonna do, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm gonna stand like back to back with you, is that all right? Sure. I... You ready? Okay, I'd like you to flip through it. We're going to stand here, and I'm standing here so that you can feel me move, so that you know I'm not like turning around to like peek over your shoulder or anything. You got it? Gotcha. I'd like you to flip through that book to any page that you like, and then change your mind and flip to another page and settle on it and get it focused in your head, because what I'm going to try to do is read your mind and have you portray the images of what's on that page in the book. Have you got a page? Yes. What's the page number for that page? 51. 51? And, and you like that page? Yes. Okay, instead of focusing on the words, first of all, start by kind of uh, <coughs> looking through, and the, the page is divided up into paragraphs and sections. And think about like the second, the second section. Skip, skip over the first, there's like a first paragraph, and then there's something distinct as a, as a second item, correct? Yes. Um, is, is that a quote? Yes. It, it's, uh, so it's like a, a sentence that somebody's uttering. Yes. And, and it's kind of, um, I'm getting a very positive feeling from it, like this is an <laughs> affirmation. Uh, does it say something like, uh, of course, or something like that in there? Yes. It does. All right. <laughs> Scroll down a little bit, just a little bit further. Is there, I'm getting a, a country, like, <laughs> it, is there something about China on that page? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> and, and a little further down, um, actually towards the bottom, does it say something like, I'm, I'm beginning to think Watson said Holmes? Is that in there? Yes. Word for word, just like that? Yes. All right. Isn't that amazing? Yes. It's almost like I have my own copy of the book or something. <laughs> However, uh, my copy of the book is a little different from your copy of the book. And it doesn't have any words in it. So, thank you very much, sir, for coming up here. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. You can sort that out. And by the way, uh, I'm doing the uh, American Atheist Convention in Memphis. And instead of actually giving a talk, I'm, 
I'm kind of doing what I did at Apostacon two years ago, and I'm doing a, an hour-long magic and minimalism show. So that's just a little taste of something fun. But the title of the, that they gave this talk is Confronting Christianity. Ooh, there's, that's ominous. <laughs> so when I got here this weekend, I, uh, I took a nap this morning, and then I was, my shoulders hurt, my back hurt. It's a, it's, it was a long drive. And uh, Beth said, hey, why don't you go sit down in the hot tub and relax? So I did. Um, and somebody came up to me in the hot tub, I don't know if you're here, but he specifically asked about a conversation they'd had with someone about the effects of the, the magical water from Lord's France that supposedly heals people and, and asked, you know, kind of, how do you deal with a claim like that? How is it that you can have a conversation with someone to get someone to realize whether or not this is believable? And what you're really asking at that point is, how do we go about teaching someone skepticism? How do we go about teaching them critical thinking? And simply pointing out that they're making a fallacious statement may not actually have any impact. And it especially may not have an impact, you can sort out the, gr the grammar in that sentence, if you actually just name the fallacy. Oh, that's an argument from ignorance. I can't count the number of times that I've come home from the TV show. By the way, I do the Atheist Experience television show. I'm assuming some of you may have seen it. Um, and, and one of the things that's made that show kind of popular is that I am woefully under-credentialed and perhaps a little under-educated as well. And so I'm, you know, I come from a Baptist background. I'm kind of plain spoken. I can usually explain things in ways that people can understand. And I've come home from the show on numerous occasions where my wife would just kind of glare at me and say, why did you say argument from ignorance? These people don't know what argument from ignorance means. They don't understand that it's a fallacy. They think you're just calling them stupid. Why not explain what the problem is rather than just giving it a name? And she's right. And I've tried to make steps to kind of correct that. Pointing out that their evidence is suspect in the case of people who have claimed to be healed may also not be enough. Well, how do you know that this person was sick? Was there a clear diagnosis before this? Was there a clear diagnosis after? Were we able to, tra to, to trace this process? Um, how can we confirm the healing? How do you know that the report that you're getting from these sources is you know, true and unbiased? And so one of the things you may have to do is get to the heart of why they believe and then find out whether they really think that this justification that they're using for this claim is a good one by trying to apply it to other claims. You can come up with examples of things that could be justified by those same means. Recently, I did a video on faith, and one of the things that I wanted to point out is, is there anything that you can't justify by appealing to faith? And if that's the case, then isn't faith useless? It's not a pathway to knowledge or truth or understanding. It is, I give up. It is the excuse people give when they don't have a good reason. If you have a good reason, you never make an appeal to faith. We just, we just heard a whole bunch about citizen science do we make appeals to faith when we're doing, you know, astronomy? I don't think so. So why is it that, this, this, that these God beliefs and these superstitious um, spiritual woo beliefs have carved out this special area where it seems to be okay that they can just say, oh, you have to have faith? Are they going to consistently apply that faith to every new situation that comes up? Is the reason that they believe this good enough to believe other things? And Another important thing to remember is that you may not convince them right now. It may take some time. It may take some other people. It may be that you're just not particularly good at communicating with this particular individual. And somebody else may be even better in with this individual, whereas the two of you may have the opposite results with somebody else. There's a personality component to these conversations. There are people who think that I'm an arrogant, condescending asshole. And they're not wrong <laughs> about that. They're wrong about a bunch of other stuff. There, there are perceptions here. And, and what I strive to do on the show is to make sure that people get about as good as they give. And if you're willing to have an honest conversation and acknowledge points and uh, revise things and, and carry on a, a decent conversation, you'll get 30, 40 minutes on the show. I get complaints. Why'd you let that person talk so long? Well, because they were having an honest conversation. I don't care if we get to one call or 50 calls in the course of a show if we're actually getting to a point where we're conveying information that other people may understand and the person that I'm speaking to is having an honest conversation. I'm not trying to convince the person on the phone. 
at least not right there then at that moment. It may come much, much later. So when I got up today, uh, or, uh, I slept till about noon or so, and I jumped over in the hot tub, and uh, I had this little conversation. I got out of the hot tub, and I felt amazing. And I didn't even take any painkillers. I think the hot tub at the Ramada Inn is miraculous. <laughs> my shoulders were sore, my back was sore. I didn't go to a doctor, I don't have to. I know what pain feels like. I was walking like this when we got here, and now I can dance, which is what we got to do at the prom. It's a miracle. <laughs> this is the quality of information that we get with regard to miraculous cures. I can't prove to you that the hot tub is miraculous, but I'll just take it on faith. I did three nights of debate at a Church of Christ in San Antonio, Texas, and I talked a little bit about it during the Unholy Trinity tour. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about it because I have this book. Ken Ham, you around? I've got a book too. I got a bunch of books. This one is called The Evolution of Enlightenment. Can Science and Religion Coexist? It's the 27th annual Shenandoah Lecture Series from the Church of Christ in San Antonio. And what they did was they invited a whole bunch of Church of Christ preachers. Don't call them pastors or ministers. They're preachers. They get really mad about that. Um, to come in and speak to each other, primarily. There were members of the congregation there as well. And they pre-printed all of their lectures. And then they gave me a copy because they invited me down and said, hey, we'd like you to come down for this uh, weekend. Originally, they wanted all four days, and, and I did do all four days, but we'd whittled it down to three to begin with. And they said, we'd like you to listen to what we have to say during the day and then do a two-hour debate on those topics that evening. And I was like... Now, I do a lot of debates, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that I think I've gotten to the point where I'm pretty decent at it. There are a lot of people who are better, and it depends on the subject. If we're talking about creation versus evolution, I'm going to defer to somebody who spends a lot more time dealing with that, somebody like Arn Ra. But anybody who's ever, how many people have ever done like a formal debate, like at a university or whatever in, in that setting? There's a lot of prep work involved. And I try to shoot for no more than one debate every month or so. And some of those end up being, I'm going to come on your podcast and do this debate. And I'm leveraging a decade of live call-in television and several decades of actually believing this crap to begin with. <laughs> and so I, I have some advantages. And one of the biggest, most important things about doing a debate is... Ideally, you should know your opponent's position at least as well as they do, if not better. And so that's one of the, one of the advantages that I may have. But I went down here and I was like, who has ever done anything like this? Three, ni three nights of debates? They wanted four, and I was like, hell no. But three, yeah, I'm just that crazy. <laughs> not, not crazy enough for four, but I'll do three. So I sat there, and I listened to these guys get up and preach to each other all day. And I took lots and lots of notes. I actually have a, like a legal pad that's completely full of all the notes that I took during the day. They were amazed. Never before had a godless heathen walked in, accepted their invitation, and actually showed up and listened to them, and then took notes. I think it might have made them a little nervous. <laughs> I get emails from people, uh, quite often young people, who say, hey, I don't believe this garbage anymore, but my parents make me go to church, what should I do? Go, take notes, and ask lots of questions. <laughs> it's very likely they will stop making you go. And even if they don't, you learn something of value because you're going to get out in the world and you're not going to have to stop dealing with religion. You're not going to have to stop dealing with the religious privilege and preference and this presumption that you're going to go to church. Hey, what church do you go to? You move to a new town. That's the first question to ask. Well, you don't believe? Why don't you believe? I want to be able to help people be prepared to give better answers for why they don't believe because that better answers to those questions results in more non-believers who have better answers to those questions, who can create more non-believers who have better answers to those questions, then we're done. You know, they tell two friends and they tell two friends, and say, is anybody old enough for that commercial? So this is, 
there's a lot of things in here that, that, are, that I would love to say are my favorite things. Uh, this is anybody, anybody here former Church of Christ? I can't really see it. Cool. So one of the things uh, about Church of Christ, there's no music. There are no, there's no stained glass. There's no iconography or anything like that. Uh, the no music thing was a bit of a problem for me because they still sing. And, and I'm not saying that these, that this was, I've said before it was kind of like all the worst American Idol auditions put together, but that's not true. That's me just being mean. Uh, the truth is a lot of them can sing, but if you don't even have like, you know, a harp to start off with the right note, what you get is people who can sing, who are singing in different keys, just all over the place. I don't know why, if there's a God, he wouldn't like beautiful music and let you at least blow the first note. You know. But uh, we're sitting there. I was there the first day all by myself, did the debate. Uh, Beth had to work, and she came with me on the second day. And Beth loves uh, the little uh, tracks that churches put out for visitors that tell you all about their church and other stuff. And like, just tons of them have questions about God. What does God think about sex and all this other stuff? And I'm, I'm sitting there, and she comes rushing over, and she goes, honey, honey, look. Now, before I tell you what she said, uh, as a Southern Baptist, I would have looked at the Church of Christ and said, that's a cult. Just like we did with the Catholics. <laughs> and just like every other church does to every other church. Cult is what the big church calls the little church, especially if it's particularly weird in some areas, like not blowing a harp to start off the music. <laughs> but she comes rushing over because we'd had this conversation, and there's a pamphlet that says, why the Church of Christ is not a cult. <laughs> I, I, she's probably saying, have you still got it? No? I wouldn't have kept it either. But if you have to print a pamphlet, maybe you've got a little bit of a PR problem. The very first uh, speaker to get up was uh, Kerry Clark, uh, and the topic was, how did we get here a universe from nothing? The, the entire course of this weekend was going to be talking about arguments from design and cosmology, and boy, they really don't like Lawrence Krauss or Richard Dawkins or anybody you know, in that realm. And I opened this up before he ever started speaking, and I was dumbfounded to discover that on the very second sentence, there was a logical fallacy that was just blatant. And the only reason it's not the first sentence is because the first sentence is a quote from Hebrews. <laughs> Hebrews 3, 4, for every house is builded by some man, but that he that built all things is God. And the sentence that follows that is, this eternal principle has never been proven wrong. <laughs> I suppose you could call it an eternal principle, although, you know, the, the actual quote that he's quoting is an eternal, but has never been proven wrong. Right off the beginning, they're shifting the burden of proof to, hey, we believe this and nobody can prove us wrong. Well, congratulations, you can make up a bazillion fictional false beliefs that nobody can prove wrong. That's... I did that with my mind. Uh, that's why science has within the, the realm of this idea of what is testable, an idea about falsifiability. That if there's nothing that can prove your hypothesis wrong, then it doesn't even qualify as a hypothesis. It becomes untestable. And so if all you're going to do is say that, well, nobody's ever proven me wrong, congratulations, and call me when you've proven that you're actually correct. Uh, I took, I, I scribbled notes throughout this thing and underlined all kinds of stuff, um, including them misquoting and misrepresenting Bertrand Russell um, and Lawrence Krauss and, and others. And one of the things that struck me is that you had more than one preacher get up on stage to say the, something like, now I don't really understand the science, but I talked to someone who does and let me explain why it's wrong. <laughs> there were comments made about these people with a bunch of letters after their name trying to tell us what's real. <laughs> there was this three day long parade of not just ignorance, not just willful ignorance, 
but joyful, gleeful celebration of willful ignorance and an attempt to encourage others to be willfully ignorant. And for those who know me, there are a few things that are going to piss me off faster than that. <laughs> we had a lot of conversations. The videos are actually available online. Um, I debated the, the main preacher there, his brother, is the person that they set up to debate me every evening. And how many people have seen those debates? I don't know. Cool, so the rest of you won't be quite so bored by this. Um, it, there's actually far too much to go into, and, and I don't even recommend that you go watch them, but you can. Um, I, I'm going to be putting up videos at some point, kind of doing a, a deconstruction of them. There were a number of things that really bothered them. Number one, they were ticked off that I kept saying, I don't know. They had this mindset that programmed them as to what to expect in this debate. We're claiming God exists and God did it and this is the answer. And you're here to say that that's false and there's some other answer. And if ever they asked things like, do you have an explanation for consciousness? No. You don't? Well, tell me how this happened. I don't know. I'm not convinced any of us know. You're the one claiming to have an answer. Would you like to provide the evidence and the argument to support your actual answer? And if, you're, if I find it compelling, then I'll agree with you. But my lack of an answer doesn't make your answer correct. This is the mindset of the creationists that go through and try to poke holes in evolution. And even if they poked holes so much that evolution ceased to be a concrete theory, they're not one step closer to proving creationism is true. And man, they got mad. By the third night, I think, uh, Israel, the, the gentleman I was debating, said, well, every time we ask Matt a question, he just says, I don't know, which is a bit of an exaggeration because there were a lot of things that I did provide my answers for. And the main preacher came up to me at one point and said, doesn't it bother you? Doesn't it bother, are you happy going to your grave not knowing the answers to these questions? No, I'm not. None of us are. We are all uncomfortable with this idea of not knowing. And that's why we have science. That's why we go out and try to find what the actual damned answer is. I, it's not that I'm comfortable not knowing, it's that I'm more uncomfortable pretending that I know. We got into a discussion. I would raise problematic verses where God, you know, in this, uh, when Moses is trying to free his people from slavery, something which almost certainly didn't happen, but it would say Pharaoh was ready to let everybody go, and then God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, if you read through that entire process, what happens is uh, Moses wants Pharaoh to let his people go. Pharaoh says, no. So, okay, here's a plague. Oh, I'll let him go now. And then it says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart after he was willing to let him go, and then had him refuse. Now, that seems to me to be a violation of free will, if, if in fact anybody believes in that sort of thing. But you've got God stepping in, Pharaoh wants to let him go, and God's like, hey, I'm not done showing off just yet. <laughs> I got nine more of these bitches to come at you. <laughs> and I said, isn't it a problem that God is hardening Pharaoh's heart? Well, if you read it correctly, yeah. Pharaoh is hardening his own heart. <laughs> Hang on. And I open up their Bible, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Yes, but if you read it correctly, <laughs> Pharaoh is hardening his own heart. God hardened favor. The Bible correctly read that phrase or some version of it was uttered a bazillion times that weekend anytime I'd raise an objection to the Bible. The Bible correctly read, oh, you mean if I agree with your interpretation, then the problem goes away. Well, congratulations. Why on earth should I agree with your interpretation if the book says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Hey, what about slavery? I asked, because on the third night we debated morality, uh, and that was loads of fun. <laughs> and I raised the issue of slavery, because anybody who watches the show knows that it's my go-to argument. It's the one that's most obviously immoral and most clearly endorsed. Just yesterday, I, was it yesterday? Yeah, it was yesterday. Wow. Need sleeps. 
Uh, just yesterday, I was at University of Texas lecturing to a class, and after it was over, I've done two debates with a guy by the name of Cliff Connectley at Texas State. And he happened to be at UT Austin preaching, uh, although for some reason he doesn't want to debate me again. Maybe it's because I'm that condescending asshole guy, I don't know. Um, but he was out there and somebody asked him about slavery and he lied once again. And I'm not, I'm not very free with accusing people of lying, uh, but I think that's the only explanation for it after we've had this discussion. Because when we talk about the, does the Bible endorse slavery, he goes to a passage from Paul where he's talking to his uh, Philemon, who would run away slaves, saying, I want you to go back. And when you go back, tell your master, I don't want you to be a slave anymore, that type of thing. And he thinks that this is the Bible saying that slavery is wrong. And he says this while ignoring everything in Exodus 21 that expressly tells you who to enslave, how to enslave them, that there were six shekels, that you have to let Jews go after seven, oh, sorry, Jewish males go after seven years. The women you get to keep after seven years unless you give them a wife and kids and then you can trick them into being your slave forever that it expressly says that these are your property that you can pass down that you are to buy your slaves from the heathen around you and somehow or another none of that matters to cliff because paul wanted his slave friend to not be a slave anymore this is the way theists will think there's a tap dance to make the bible say whatever they need it to say and when we had this debate at the Church of Christ and I brought up slavery, we went, we went through this again. And I heard several different explanations from several different preachers. One of them said, well, this was the norm at the time. And God was implementing laws about slavery to soften slavery so that we would eventually realize that slavery was wrong and get rid of it. He's God! If he can tell you don't kill people and don't eat shrimp, certainly he can say don't own people as property. How hard was that? What kind of weak ass tiny God do you believe in that he can't tell you to stop owning people? Well, he was actually trying to do the right thing because all these heathen, this was the only way that they could come to the true understanding of God was for the Jews to go over there and enslave them so that they could teach them about Yahweh. Well, once again, he's God. What's he doing picking the Jews, not giving messages to anybody else anymore? I mean, I know that the Old Testament's a comedy of his failures where everything goes wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong until eventually he's just down to, oh, okay, I'm gonna take this one little family and I'm gonna turn it into my preferred tribe and it's still gonna go wrong, by the way. Spoiler alert, everything goes wrong for God all the way through the book. And yet somehow, he thinks it's a good idea. Hey, these other people here who are not my chosen people, but I'd really like them to believe in me. Why don't we enslave them? And then we can teach them about me. Go on, Moses, go do that. This is the type of tap dancing that you get when you engage in people who cannot acknowledge that the Bible might be endorsing something that's immoral, that they might be believing in something that doesn't have good reason. There were other things that they were concerned about. Uh, if you, you can watch the Unholy Trinity uh, tour video, uh, we got into a big discussion about whether or not words have intrinsic meaning. Spoiler alert, they don't. They have usages, and this really irked them. Uh, because, well, how can you say that what, you know, what any of these words mean? How, hey, I tell you what, why don't you explain to me why the all-powerful creator of the universe is not bright enough to reveal his message in something other than languages that he knew would change and die off, and then expect us in the 21st century to learn dead languages and study them and study in context absent the actual information that you would need to properly understand. If somebody looked back at our time and took a look at the language we use and tried to sort it out, they would need the context. And fortunately for them, we've got you know, the internet and countless amount of footage on television so they can pick through and sort this out. In this case, we've got fragments. And you're gonna say that Oh, I know it literally says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, but what it really means is this. Well, which book did you pull that, pull that from? Oh, oh, the book of right out of your ass. <laughs> I started, uh, I lost my job last January, and um, in August or so I went live with a, a Patreon channel. I'm, I'm not advertising for it, this is in the point. The point is I wanted to create videos that gave people an in-depth understanding 
of the arguments for the existence of God, about the topics that they're likely to find themselves engaging with when they engage with believers. And I didn't want to just give them, hey, when they say this, you say this, because that's dumb. They're the ones with a script. We're the ones with understanding, or at least we should be. And so you can clap. I don't care. I mean, I like it. I, I do care. I, I am, uh, I'm going to use, I'm going to use a word even, uh, it, this is just for humor. Just, I am so incredibly blessed right now. <laughs> um, I've been hosting this show for 10 years and I'm finally, uh, like some of my friends, uh, Greta Christina and Hemet and Aaron and Seth, and, well not Seth yet, but I am a full-time professional godless heathen now, thanks to the generosity of our community that has supported my efforts in producing these videos. We need a lot more of this a lot more of educating beyond the surface and making sure that we're not just giving people another script because while we might mock someone like Ray Comfort for using a script, our goal is to get him off of his script to see what he can actually think about because that's where he really falls down. And if we put two people with a script head to head, what the hell are we doing? Why would we do that? Why would we not try to impart an understanding? I'm doing a lot of that. Why? because minds do change. I changed my mind. I'm sure there's plenty of people in this room who've changed their minds. I have thousands of emails from people who've changed their minds because of what we've done on the TV show or what they saw in a debate or what they read at somebody's blog. The conversation that they had with their friend who saw a TV show or read a blog. At the end of that uh, series of debates at the Church of Christ, uh, some strange stuff happened. First of all, on Monday, I came back um, just to have a little talk, no debate. And I was approached by some members of the church who let me know that some of the members of the church had gone to the elders and said, hey, why did you bring this guy down here to speak in our church? Because we think that he was making better points than our guy was making. <laughs> And I, you know, because I, I had stood up, I was, I was expected to never hear from them again because I stood up on Sunday night at their pulpit in their church and explained to them that if they thought the Bible was a good moral guide, I could prove that that wasn't true. I can write a better moral book than the Bible and I could prove it to every one of them sitting there because I could write the damn thing word for word, reverse its position on slavery, and it's already a better book. And I could go through and do this for every other thing that was in there that we now know to be wrong. And I didn't expect to hear from them ever again. And instead, what I heard was, hey, why did you invite this guy? This didn't really quite go the way we expected. And so on Monday morning, uh, there were a couple preachers who got up and basically, in the course of their talk, said something like, hey, we've heard from people who are a little concerned that perhaps... Matt might have made some better points than our guy. And we just wanted to remind you that this was about having an open dialogue and discussion, and it's not about who wins. <laughs> and that was awesome, because you know I liked hearing it. I liked the fact that people were thinking. And I am, in fact, a fan of this uh, discussion. I also like to be the one who's making the better points. You know, and it doesn't suck. But then something weird happened. The guy that I was debating got up and stood at the pulpit and said and chastised the other preachers for daring to suggest that he had not won the debate and that winning didn't matter. <laughs> Scolded them from the pulpit. And then he sat down. And then his brother, who's the main preacher, got up and scolded his brother for scolding the rest of the church. <laughs> I have come here to pit brother against brother and destroy churches across the land. <laughs> now, that, that said, I'm sure that everybody in that church is fine because there's nobody like me there to challenge them right now and they've managed to do their little weaseling. Oh, you need to read it this way and you've got to interpret it this way and they've gotten everybody pretty much back on track or almost everybody because I got emails from members of that church including one gentleman whose wife had died and his church is opposed to sex outside of marriage. And he said, I have needs. What do you think about me going out and having sex with someone? Now, think about that. This is, a, this is someone who's been in a church 
whose only legitimate authority is the New Testament. Not even the preacher. It's only the New Testament. Although, technically, that's not true if you talk to some former Church of Christ folks, because if you disagree with your church's position on what the New Testament says, uh, it doesn't matter how well you think you can back it, you're done. Uh, you can ask Tracy Harris about that. But that's their source of authority. And I go down there for a weekend, and this guy is reaching outside of his church to get somebody else's opinion. Now, I don't know what he ended up doing. Um, I told him, do it. If you can find a consenting adult and you're not harming anybody else, why should you care what I think or what you're chasing? Stop looking for any authority on this. Don't go to your church for authority. Don't go to the New Testament for authority. Think about the morality and the ethics of the situation. Make sure that you're taking advantage of a situation where you are not taking advantage of someone and have all the sex you want. <laughs> Stop looking for the authorities outside of there. I don't know what he did. I didn't, I didn't hear back from him. I did a debate in Amarillo, Texas, where a, a young girl who, who had been raised by secular parents and had allowed her to explore uh, many different religious ideas uh, came up at the end of that debate and said, uh, you know, I, I've done a lot of this, I've thought about this, and um, thanks to what you guys did at this debate tonight, I'm now comfortable identifying as an atheist. Minds do change, and sometimes they change fairly quickly, and sometimes it takes a lot of time, but they do change. You have to remember that we're dealing with real people here. And the ideas that we accept inform our actions. And the actions we take have consequences for ourselves and for others. So why do I do what I do? I want to change the world. I want to change the whole world. God, if he exists, to uh, paraphrase Al Pacino and Devil's Advocate, is an absentee landlord. And while it may give some people comfort to believe that the landlord may, ev may eventually show up and fix some things, there's no good reason to think that's going to happen, and our pipes are leaking right now. I want a world where marriage equality is a reality. I want a world where anti-choicers have all changed their minds or have no more impact on legislation. I, I want a world where there are no second-class citizens. A world where religion isn't forced into impressionable minds as if it were true. Where people are taught how to think instead of what to think. Where skepticism and critical thinking are valued. Where science isn't merely valued where it's convenient where no cat is ever declawed. <laughs> I want a world where no one is ever bullied or made to feel like an outsider, where all people earn a fair wage, and where people can speak their mind without fear of threats and harassment intended to bully them into silence. I want a world where mental illness is no longer stigmatized so that people can get the help that they need and deserve. I want a world where the purported psychics no longer act as parasites on the grief-stricken or mislead time-sensitive investigations. I want a world where nobody goes hungry or thirsty. I want a world where people don't ignore the firefighters, the search and rescue swimmers, the paramedics, the surgeons, and all the other good people who dedicate their lives to saving lives while praising their God and giving him credit for the work those people do. I want a world where real medicine is never secondary to prayer or pseudoscientific alternatives where no child dies because their parents' religion forbids life-saving treatments. I want a world where you're elected based on your position, on the issues, and not the position you're in when you pray. I want a world where sex is something you do with someone instead of to someone. I want a world where someone's value isn't primarily based on how they can make you feel. I want a world where citizens are still subject to the laws of the state and not the laws of the religious group that they belong to. 
I want a world where honor killings, acid attacks, and the stoning of people accused of witchcraft, or adultery, or driving a car, or daring to be in public without a man are ideas that have long faded into the past and are viewed as the obvious inhuman abominations that they are. I want all of these things and more, and I'm not talking about some pie-in-the-sky utopia. I know we're never going to have a perfect world because we're prone to mistakes. But we can minimize the mistakes, and we can oppose the intentional harm, and we can combat the willful, intentional, gleeful ignorance that people embrace on behalf of religions and superstitions. A perfect world is probably impossible, but a better world is definitely possible. And a better world is attained by aiming for the best possible world. Now, I can't address all these issues and be effective. I have to choose which ones I care more about at any given moment, and I have to focus my energies there while being mindful that these other issues exist and need attention. I have to find out where my strengths and passions are most effective. What do you want to do? What do you want to focus on? Where do your skills best serve? Are you a comedian, a musician, an author, an artist? I can't begin to list all of the artists who influenced me without me even knowing it. Going back now, as someone who was a Christian for 25 years and who's now a godless heathen, and listening to lyrics that I'd never really paid attention to, rewatching movies and comedy acts from my youth, I find countless pro-secular and even anti-religious messages that didn't click then, but definitely helped tune my mind toward becoming more receptive to differing points of view. Are you good at organizing events, leading groups, handling finances, motivating people, sharing information? There's a place for you in some organization on all of those areas. Are you in a position to merely be open and out so that people know that the good neighbor that they already like is a godless, secular, atheist, free-thinking, LGBTQ, skeptical humanist, making it virtually impossible for them to maintain a bigoted view of whatever label they previously disparaged? We need this sort of cultural change because it's hard to vilify and minimize any category of people if you already know and like people in that category. How many minds were changed about the homosexual community or transgender community because there were so many people out there that almost everyone had a relative or a friend or a friend of a relative from those communities making it very difficult to keep viewing them as others? Marriage equality is at or near the tipping point. At this point, I think it's pretty much a race to see which state is so bigoted, backward, and Bible-bound that they're going to be the last one to grant rights to people. <laughs> if it hasn't actually moved beyond the tipping point, it's very close. But religious privilege and prominence aren't at the tipping point. It may not even be close to the tipping point. But there are religious individuals who are. And after a lifetime of going around with all the indoctrinated, unquestioning minds that surround them, they're now engaging their doubts and eager to explore the world. But they need encouragement, they need education, and they need communities to land in when their minds finally give in to reality. I'm focused on religion, philosophy, theology, and I'm doing it through debates and education. And many times I've heard people snidely condemn someone for focusing on one issue instead of another that might seem to be more important. There should be no contest or competition about which issue is bigger or more in need of focus because every second spent arguing about who's doing the most good on the biggest issue is a second that wasn't spent fixing either one of them. And in all of this, no matter which issues we address, we can't forget to enjoy life to live, to love, to eat, to mourn, to celebrate, and to just be. And for most of us, that means embracing the social creatures we are and sharing thoughts, tragedies, and triumphs. Religionists often try to suggest that our lives must be some joyless, purposeless existence. It's one of many lies that have been spread about secularists, and I'm hoping to help alongside many other individuals and groups, uh, those who are dedicated to, to correct the misinformation from those who are dedicated to presenting this misinformation repeatedly to the public. I want to change the world. I want to eliminate religious and superstitious thinking. I want to end religious privilege. I want a world like the one I described. And I'm working toward this goal by debating those who spread these ideas and educating others on how to be more effective at engaging those who spread these ideas. What do you want to do? What kind of world do you want?
And what's keeping you from doing it? Thanks. Can we have the lights so I don't feel so alone anymore? <laughs>